Welcome to the Press One for Nick podcast. My name is Nick Limsdell, and my guest this week is Chris Voss. For the five people who do not know who you are, Chris is the world's number one negotiation coach, CEO of the Black Swan Group, a firm that solves business negotiation problems with hostage negotiation strategies. Chris founded the Black Swan, Black Swan Group in 2008 upon his retirement from the FBI, where he was the FBI's lead international kidnapping negotiator. Last, he's also the best-selling author of the book, Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if Your Life Depends on It. And just recently, it made the Books Authority Best Influence Books of All Time. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Hey, man, I'm happy to be here. Happy to be on. Thanks for having me in. Yes, sir. So one question I ask every guest is, what's one thing people might not know about you? Wow. I'm a grandfather. How about that? <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, I grew up in Iowa. I'm a small town Iowa boy. I know, I know the accent doesn't sound like it, but I grew up in small Midwestern town. I, I love that. I appreciate the, the honesty and, and uh, kind of stepping out. Uh, I've gotten everywhere from uh, I, I've hold, I, I held gold at a, at a crazy museum to I played adult hockey to uh, all sorts of neat things. So uh, being being a grandfather is a great honor. Yeah, it's cool. You know, my son Brandon runs my company. Actually, we got a team at the Black Swan Group. We got an entire team of coaches, negotiation coaches. So uh, yeah, he's uh, he, he made me on Father's Day last year. He became a father, and I became a grandfather. That's awesome. So cool. So let's dig into your book a little bit. You got this awesome book, Never Split the Difference negotiating as if life depends on it. There's a lot of stuff that you've been through in, in, uh, in your time in the FBI, and you've taken that and, and put it into a book. You took time and took classes at, at Harvard. Uh, you, you taught there. You went through this course, uh, and you're, you're kicking butt and taking names now at the Block Swan Group. So I got a bunch of questions that I'm going to run through, and uh, I'd, I'd love to uh, start that today. Yeah, cool. Let, let's get into it. Because you know what I what I love about being on with you is we want to help as many people as we possibly can. You know, wherever you are, we, we want to find a way to help you. So let, let's get into it. We'll lay some stuff out. All right. So the first question I got is, how long do you have to make that first impression? All right. So there's, uh, I want to answer that a couple of different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, because what's more important than the first impression is the lasting, lasting impression. But you got seven to 10 seconds to make a first impression. And um, there, you know, there are two bells you need to ring in that seven to 10 seconds. And you can only ring them in a really counterintuitive way. But seven okay. to 10 seconds for the first impression. And what happens in that seven? Is, yeah, what is that? All right, so first of all, and, uh, trust and competence are the two things which seem like a really tall order at the very beginning, um, which is why a lot of people, you know, it's not laying out your resume. It's not saying, trust me. You don't, people don't trust you by saying, if you say, trust me. And everybody knows that. Uh, but here's something that most people don't know. Because empathy is about demonstrating understanding. And you don't show that you've understand, understood people by saying, I understand. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't happen. So those of you that are out there that are think, thinking you're saying, I understand, is going to make the other side feel like you understand them. Um, you know, I'm sorry, I, I, got, I got bad news for you. It's as effective as saying, trust me. <laughs> and so as a hostage negotiator... How did you, you talked about those two things, but you got people that are robbing banks that are taking uh, hostages. How did you make that first impression count? Yeah. Um, first of all, it's your tone of voice. You know, one of the things that we teach in the Black Swan Method is, um, you know, what tones of voice are good, what tones of voice are bad. Basically, especially at the beginning, the late night FM DJ voice. Now I'm impacting your mirror neurons 
and actually starting trust with you just based on the sound of my voice. It's a neurological response. That voice is reassuring. It feels trustworthy. So before I've even finished the sentence, I've gotten started on building trust. And, you know, when I negotiated the Chase Manhattan Bank robbery hostage taking back in the last century, you know, I don't even want to say what year it was. Uh, the, the second bank robber on the inside surrendered to me personally. He came on the phone after we'd been on the phone for five hours. He didn't know that the negotiators had switched from the other guy to me, from Joe to Chris. But he gets on the phone and about 90 seconds in, he says, I trust you. That was completely based on my tone of voice. So mm -hmm. the, the mechanism, if you will, people these days like to talk about hacks and shortcuts. What you're really after is the most effective mechanism. The mechanism for trust before you finish the sentence is your tone of voice. So in customer service and customer experience, you always think of in customer service specifically, right? You get the people that are fired up. They are, they are ready to, to rip that customer service representative a new one. Right. And you're saying, how do I get them to calm down and maybe not meet, meet that match that voice or their cadence? but slow down the conversation to get them to trust you. Once they trust you, then you can start solving their problem. Yeah, there's, you know, you, you touch on something that is so misunderstood because there's a lot of training out there that says match their cadence and then they'll feel that you're like, and then start taking your voice down. And people go like, holy Mac, holy cack, uh, holy mackerel, you know, that worked. Well, it worked in spite of the first part. What really worked was when you started to take your voice down, that's when it came down. <laughs> there wasn't this bonding moment while they were melting down. So you should melt down simultaneously. You know, they didn't go like, holy cow, I'm melting down. He's melting down. We must be alike. I'm willing to follow his lead. No, 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 no. I feel that so much better now. Time. Yeah, yeah, th yeah. Thank God you're as out of control as I am. You know, that's just that's nonsense. Yeah. But people miss it because of when the mechanism went into gear was when you started to take your voice down. Uh, they say like, "Wow, you know that worked." Um, yeah, it worked, but you 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 know it it was delayed because you screwed up the first part. Yeah. It could have worked a lot quicker if you would have been a buffoon at the beginning. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So in the book, you talked about listening is the cheapest yet most important concession. Can you explain that? Yeah. You know, it doesn't cost you anything to listen. And listening is not simply not talking, waiting for your turn. You know, a lot of people misconstrue silence is listening when they're really waiting for their turn. You know, listening is actually hearing what other people say. Tactical empathy is a demonstration of understanding. And you don't demonstrate your understanding by saying, I understand. You know, you, you listen, you dial in, you use one of the black swan tools, probably a label. It seems like it sounds like it looks like, or if, you, if your game is stepped up to the next level based on our training, you can adjust that slightly, but a hostage negotiator is going to say right off the bat, you, you know, sound upset. You, you sound like you want to get out of here, get out of there. You, you sound like, sounds like the day is not going as you planned it. You know, that's uh, dialing into showing, demonstrating an understanding of the dynamic. And what is the importance about labeling those fears? Ah, so completely counterintuitive. Labeling fears diffuses them. And we're much more into neuroscience these days with tactical empathy, the application of empathy with the tactical understanding from neuroscience. Neuroscience has shown us really clearly through experiments, and a bunch of people have done these. The first time I ran across the experiment was in a book called The Upward Spiral, 
where they put people in fMRIs, fag functional magnetic resonance imaging equipment, where you could they could watch the electrical flow of thoughts in the brain. It lights up like electricity. They show people um, a picture that induces a negative thought. You know, it could be a puppy in the rain, could be a baby seal, could, you know, make, you know, who knows? It doesn't matter. You know, it could be a little old lady uh, all by herself looking lonely. All they know is that it induces negative thoughts. The person sees a picture, the appropriate areas of the brain are pre-identified as where essentially negative emotions are amplified, lights up, the amygdala. And then they simply ask the people, what are you feeling? Which is a self-label. And every time the people would self-label, simply call the negative emotion out, the electrical activity would diminish. Now, there's two important things there to remember. First of all, it happened every time. Secondly, the degree of impact was not always the same. You can label a negative emotion with someone and it might look like it had no effect. You know, they may continue to stare at you. Well, it had an impact. It just wasn't as much as you hoped for. Sometimes you label negative emotions and, and you watch the person completely relax. Or, you know, my son Brandon's got a great story where he was standing in front of a judge who was upset with him in a courtroom. <laughs> And, you know, he did what we refer to in a black swan method as an accusations audit, which is taking a scientific wild ass guess, a swag, at all the negative emotions that somebody's feeling and calling them all out. I mean, going for it, firing every cannonball you have. And he's, and as he's doing that, he says, she just kind of starts to, she just starts to twitch. <laughs> and, you know, uh, because, the electrical activity in her amygdala is just like bang, 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 completely changing in an instant. And, and she, she looked at him and he ends up walking out of the courtroom, having to go attend uh, a course. When walking in, he was facing a steep fine for the driving violation and potential jail time. And, and, and he didn't walk in with a clean record, you know, very few 20-somethings do not have heavy feet. I had a heavy foot when I was in my 20s. <laughs> you know, we're all race car drivers. We all think we're driving a NASCAR, male and female, until you hit the age of about 25, which is where everybody's automobile insurance drops because neurologically, that's when our brains pretty much finish forming. But, you know, 18 to 25, most of us don't even know there's a brake pedal on a car. So <laughs> he's, there's, a, there's an e-brake. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, he was no different than anybody else. He just happened to get caught. So but and, and so he's facing stiff penalties and he got nothing based on deactivating the negatives in the judge's brain. And he watched the electrical activity diminished by simply by calling them out, not denying it. You know, among the things he said was he, he didn't say, I don't want you to think I'm a stupid, undisciplined kid. He said, I know I look like a stupid, undisciplined kid. The two mm -hmm. millimeter shift, because you know, you're going to stay in front of a judge or anybody else. And you're going to say to yourself, what do I want them to not think? Yeah. I don't want you to think I'm a stupid, undisciplined kid. The two millimeter shift on this neurologically sound approach in tactical empathy is to say, I'm sure I do look this way. And you just watch that stuff deactivate. The point, though, is that he didn't say he was. He now said, you're catching I, I'm on. sure. There's a lot yes. to that. The, you know, the tiny little distinctions that almost everybody gets wrong with empathy. Understanding is not agreement. Demonstrating an understanding is not agreeing that it's true. And in today's vernacular, everybody thinks that empathy and sympathy are synonymous. It is not. It never was. The origin of the word, the, the etymology of the word, I always get etymology and entomology uh, mixed up. 
Um, but it never was sympathy. It never was compassion. It's a compassionate thing to do. You know, a, a writer that I admire greatly, Stephen Kotler, said empathy is the transmission about of empathy is the transmission of information. Sympathy is the reaction to the transmission. It's a great way to think about it. Transmitting information is not disagreement or agreement. I'm sure I look like a stupid kid. That's the transmission of information. And as you very accurately point out, not an agreement. There's a lot of power behind that. I think uh, you guys should have a Google AdWords that say how to talk to the judge after the speeding ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Put it as a hundred dollar course to get out of a speeding ticket. But how to get out of jail? Get out yeah. of jail free <laughs> for, for only ninety nine dollars. There you go. Be a black be a black swan. Attend a black <laughs> swan training and learn how to get out of your traffic tickets. I see a market. I see a market. So tell me about the the power of an open ended question. You know, the, the, the real uh, application of an open-ended question is get people to think. It's not to get an answer. Now, it's an okay mechanism to get an answer. You know, like, what's the biggest challenge you face? If the person has enough gas in their mental tank, they can answer that question. You got to catch them in the morning while they're on their first cup of coffee. There's a, there's a whole bunch of neuroscience reasons why you cannot get a good answer to that question probably after 11 o'clock in the morning, for sure after 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Circadian rhythm, decision fatigue, a whole bunch of things. On the other hand, you can ask that question at any time if you want them to stop and think. Daniel Kahneman would call that slow thinking, in-depth critical thinking, the classic, that question stopped me in my tracks. You know, that's a physical manifestation of the power of a great open-ended question. Stop them dead in their tracks. And, you, and if you choose those, you want it to start with either the word what or the word how and stay away from any other open-ended question. One of the open-ended questions that I love that you say is how am I supposed to do that? Yeah. And you use that as an FBI hostage negotiator and you use that in the Black Swan group training. And what is the, the power behind that is it, it puts them back in their seat, right? Where they have to help you make that decision. Yeah, you know, you're, and you're absolutely right on how it's one of the critical things in a Black Swan method. Um, and as I said before, stop you in your tracks question. Stop them dead in their tracks. And how am I supposed to do that hits on a lot of levels. You know, um, we refer to it on our team as forced empathy. Stop them in their tracks, force them to take a look at you. Again, the issue is not the answer. Now, nine times out of 10, their answer is gonna be something that you love. And uh, the good news, bad news about this technique, like it's only one thing that we teach in our company, but it is so powerful. And in and of itself, it can make such a massive difference in people's lives that sometimes that's the only thing that they learn. Cause they're like, bang, you're in a different world as soon as you learn that. And you got the other side cutting their price in half. You got the other side, you know, just massively changing their position based on the strength of that one single black swan method and then and then but and then the one time out of ten it's so effective that you're used to hitting grant not just home runs but grand slam home runs the one time you know you miss people just like oh like how ah, I, I i don't know what to do i you know i got that from somebody the other day she said i used how am i supposed to do that and it didn't work now that that tells me so much number one she was so flummoxed by it not working. She was used to it working ridiculously, like a magic spell. Like she'd been to Hogwarts and been taught the Patronus <laughs> charm, you know? And, and so I said, well, no, it's not that it didn't work. It's that you're so used to getting a different result. You misinterpreted the, the data that you got back. Out of one time in 10, 
by the way, nine out of 10 successes is higher than anything else that anybody else is using. But the one time in 10, the person's going to come back with, that's your problem, or if you want the deal, you'll do it, which is to immediately put it right back on you. And she called, she said, well, that was a failure. Well, no, it's not a failure. What it just told you is you're dealing with someone who's not collaborative. Now that made you smarter, wondering, going from wondering if they weren't collaborative to knowing, at least on this point. It also tells you as a negotiator, your job so that you don't leave money on the table is to find the limits. And with that application of the black swan method, you just found the limit without driving the other side from the table. Because under all other circumstances, when you push somebody to the limit, the gauge is when they start to melt down. You know, when I, I a long time ago, I wrote, read Herb Cohen's book, You Can Negotiate Anything. You know, if you're into reading the literature of negotiation, everybody that I know read this book. It's probably their first negotiation book. Herb told people, push them till they're genuinely angry, <laughs> genuinely angry, because that's when you know they're at their limit. There is always a toxic residue from genuine anger. And I remember doing that. I remember thinking like, well, cool, you know, I'm going to continue to pound this guy until he's angry, until they pound the table and they go, because that would hurt me. That would cost me. I would lose money. And, you know, Herb's instruction was like, awesome. You, you just found the limit. You did your job. Where we are here is find a limit without inducing that sort of anger, which is radioactive, toxic waste, which is not what you need for long-term successful relationships. So that, you know, that's the other thing, the misinterpretation of the data. How do you not leave money on the table? You push the other side till they say, because if you want the deal, you're going to do it. And you look like, awesome. I just did my job. Yeah. There is a ton in there too. Like, how do I continue to push somebody to that limit by still gaining their approval or trust along the way and building that relationship? Yeah. Because there yep. is, there's a fine yep. line between that of pushing yep. them to that frustration point to saying, Hey, I still like you. I still love your service. I still love the product. I still uh, appreciate you, but here's our limit. Yeah. And, and you, you hit on a really important point in that long-term relationships are how you get wealthy. It's a combination of assertion and empathy and actually in the opposite order, empathy precedes assertion. You know, and, and another thing that um, is like required reading in our company. And it's at the point now where coaches that um, we're going to bring on have to read this. And it's Bob Manukin wrote a great book called Beyond Winning. Second chapter is the best chapter on empathy that I've ever read anywhere. And I got a negotiation book. And Manukin's chapter on empathy is better than what we put up. Tension between empathy and assertiveness. And I remember looking at the chapter title thinking like, you know, Bob, what are you doing? There ain't no tension. You're making it sound like it's an either or thing. And then I get into the chapter and I realize it's almost a fake title because he clearly lays out the case that empathy precedes assertion and that empathy makes your assertion more effective. And his definition of empathy, he just flat out says it is not agreement. It's not even liking them. And when you can understand empathy that way, you can be a black swan. I love that. There's a ton to, ton to get to that black swan level. So I recommend everybody yeah. taking a peek at that book, Never Split the Difference. But the, a couple more questions I have for you. One of them and, is- yeah, I'm going to interrupt you for one second because yeah. I want to go off on a tangent on a point because you're talking you're about everybody. Huh? Whoever you are, you're at some stage of your journey as a negotiator you might be just at the beginning you might be intermediate you might be advanced we got something for you at the black swan group 
we will meet you where you are and we will help you move ahead. And the point that, that I really wanted to go off on just now, when you said everyone, everyone is at a different stage in their journey. We'll meet you where you are. And the point is, is that everybody's in negotiation, whether they know it or not. Yes. Amen. And so are you gonna... say amen. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the techniques that you do is uh, something called mirroring. And yeah. how is that? You call it the, the closest thing to a Jedi mind trick. Oh, I man. love that. But tell me more. Tell the listeners a little bit about it and why it works. Well, uh, you know, the black swan mirroring is not the mirror that you hear and also the nonsense where, you know, if they put their hand to their chin, you put your hand to your mm -hmm. chin. If they lean to one side, you lean to the same side. This is not body language mirroring. You know, that's that doesn't even come from a great place. Um, mirroring is starting out by repeating the last one to three words of what the other person has just said. Has just said? Yeah, the last one to three words. See, I just married myself. Yeah. Last one to three-ish words. It could be one word. It could be three words. It is the least amount of thought. It's the simplest mechanism there is. You don't even have to contemplate. Somewhere in the dim recesses of your mind, no matter how startled and flummoxed you are by the insanity that's coming from the other side, you can pull out the last one to three words. And it's a great skill to use when someone has just said something that has just sort of so caught you off guard that you're just you're just flummoxed. You don't know what to say. It's a it's a great way to give you time and contemplation without having the other side have any idea that's what you're doing. So it's great at getting you back on your feet. Now, what does it do to the other side? They want to talk some more. They love it. Not only do they want to talk some more, and and this is another example of how a black swan tool is a, is a next level tool if you didn't understand something that somebody just said you'd probably say what did you mean by that common common guidance ask good questions gather information that's a what question what did you mean by that what are they going to do quite likely they're going to repeat what they just said with the exact same words only louder just like an american overseas <laughs> yeah, I want, I want a donut, you know, when you're pointing at a croissant in, in France. <laughs> Give me that donut. <laughs> what? I donut. You know, we say it again louder. <laughs> but we do that to each other. Because for whatever reason, the words that we've chosen in our brain make the most sense for our vernacular. Now, many times it's got to be reworded. And a mirror actually gets people to say the same thing in different words. And it will be more enlightening for you and for them. You know, my son, Brandon, he, he's, he's got a great story, which I think is probably in the book. We're prepping to do a training and we're trying to get the notebooks together. You know, to me, the, uh, but when I say notebook, I got one picture in my head and, and he's got a different picture in his head. Now, in his head, a notebook is basically a, a folder. Um, with pockets. And that is not what we're supposed to be getting together. And so I, I asked him literally, I say, have you, you know, are the notebooks ready? And he goes, what do you mean by notebooks? Because he suspects that we're not on the same sheet of music. So what do I do? Notebooks! I say <laughs> the same word again, only louder. And it, we go through this three times until finally he mirrors me. He goes, notebooks? And I go, yeah, three ring binders. <laughs> and he's like, look, pal, in my mind, a notebook and a three ring binder are two distinct things. And that's what the mirror does, you know, and, and he mirrored me. And I, and I probably I probably did calm down a little bit. So a mirror is just repeating the last one to three ish words. A lot of people say, well, uh, can I repeat words that weren't just the last ones? And the answer is, yeah, when you get good at it, then that mirror becomes a surgical tool that you can use all over the conversation to guide things. The other side doesn't even know you're doing it. So with mirroring and labeling, what is the beauty of silence after you ask that question or mirror them, or it sounds like it seems like it feels like or sounds yeah. like, right? 
Yes, yeah, si silence, it's so powerful. You know, that we've even changed the term in, in the book, we called it effective pauses. Now we call it dynamic silence. Um, you know, as the black swan method continues to evolve and as we learn this, you know, and, and silence really comes in, in several doses. You know, there's a half a breath, there's a moment, a moment's three seconds. And dynamic silence is when you just shut the front door, you shut the heck up and you start counting thousands to yourself and look at them. Now don't glare at them. You know, don't, don't, don't look like a serial killer when you're looking at them, but count one thousands. We had people that we've trained um, who said, I've never counted past seven. I, I go expecting to go till forever. Some, some, most people never get past three. One person told us, and our, my company has literally coached thousands in all situations. One person told us they got to 45. Wow. Now that, that, that's some serious patience, but patience is a weapon. Dynamic silence brings things to you in a way that after a label or a mirror, that nothing else will. I mean, shutting the heck up, shutting the front door, dynamic silence. And, you know, here's the range of stuff we coached. When Brandon was 26, 27, he coached a $35 million difference in a merger. Got another coach, Derek. He coached a $20,000 settlement from an insurance company when they were required to give nothing. Statute of limitations was two weeks from running out in that case. It was December. When was the last time you tried to get anybody to do anything in December, let alone pay you 20 grand. They didn't have to pay. Settled that out. I mean, you know, w the team has coached everything. It's, it's actually kind of fun. I love that. The, the three to five seconds is a long time in silence, especially looking at somebody in, either over the phone or eyeball to eyeball. That, that time is is when you're not used to it. And it's the same with mirroring and labeling. When you're not used yep. to it, it gets uncomfortable. Yep. But the more that you use it to your advantage, the more comfortable you're going to get and the better you're yeah. going to get at it. Yep. Yeah. And how do you get comfortable with it in your small stakes negotiations? You know, practice with your Starbucks coffee barista or whatever they call those people. You know, your Lyft driver with your, the checkout clerk at the grocery store. You are not going to do a 45 second countdown on dynamic silence in a negotiation where you got a lot of skin in the game. No one tries a skill and executes it successfully the first time in the championship event. No professional athlete who wins championships hasn't practiced and rehearsed when it didn't matter because that's how you get better yeah professional athletes not just practice but visualize what they're ah. doing so the same is true with what you're doing right critical critical distinction and i know from the the way that you um use the term most people you know they reenact what happened and how it went down. Or if they reenact it in their head, they imagine themselves losing their cool. But a visualization is taking the same tape and editing it so that instead of losing your cool or remembering it how it went down, you, in, you visualize yourself doing it right. Like in the conversation, where you got mad and screamed at somebody, you go back and you envision yourself saying, give me a day to think about this. And then that's a rehearsal. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought that visualization up. It's a key skill for, of champions. Yeah. So there is a couple of people asked me to ask you one of some of my listeners. I, so I got a couple questions from the listeners. The, one of them is, 
Chris Voss uses negotiation tactics when he has something they want. So helicopter, cash, a getaway car. So he intrinsically has something that they want or need. I've struggled with his tactic in a setting where I don't have something someone needs, but they have something I want, resources, budget, et cetera. So I've always been curious about his thoughts in those situations where things are lopsided. Yeah, you know, um, lopsided, another term for leverage, uh, leverage like beauty's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, it's remarkable what people will, will do for you if they feel like it. Like, you know, we got a saying, never be mean to someone who could hurt you by doing nothing. Well, that's almost everybody I talk to. <laughs> or the very circumstance where you got, you think you have nothing to give and they got something you want. Well, the flip side of never be mean to somebody could hurt you by doing nothing is pretty much anybody could help you if they felt like it. So how do you get them to feel like it? Again, the question. Really counterintuitive. It's going to be deactivating the negatives. Give you an example. Um, I'm on a first date with a young lady just a couple of weeks ago. Reservation in a nice, nice steakhouse. They're walking us in. They walk us right past the table I want to sit in. And they walk us to the back room that's like isolated, no Mm -hmm. windows, storage room, not, you know, mediocre tables. And and I know, you know, there's social distancing. I've never been in there before. They're saving the prime time tables for their favorite customers. But I want a great table. My reservation is not putting me there. Plus, I don't want the waitress going back to the maitre d' and getting shot down. So we walk up to this table and I look at this young lady and I go, I am going to be the worst customer that you have tonight. Late night FM DJ voice there with the delivery. I heard that. Yeah. And then dynamic silence. Because I got to let this baby sink in. I got to let her amygdala kick in. And, you know, bad customer. I mean, she's thinking about the people that you know, they want to they want to sit there and eat barefoot or maybe they want to stick their face in their plate or, you know, what kind what what's the range of bad behavior that qualifies? She's going to envision all this stuff in a split second. I know it's going to happen. Because I want my ass to seem like a relief, seem easy. If your ask is a relief and fulfilling it is going to make them feel good. So she just she just <laughs> she's just all crestfall in front of me. And I go, I want to sit at that table over there. And she goes, oh, of course, of course. She walks us right (laughs) over. I get the best seat in the house. We sat right down and my date is impressed. (laughs) You're like, I don't, she's like, I don't know what this guy just did, but it worked. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, asymmetric situation there. I I get nothing. You know, you could say, well, yeah, you know, tips, uh, you're going to pay this, you're going to be that. Like, you can imagine all sorts of reasons where you got a disadvantage. If you're in a conversation with them, you have the opportunity to create a better outcome and make them feel great about collaborating with you. I remember hearing a say, saying, you know, in a book about men being more appealing to women, you know, how to be more of a gentleman. And the saying was, you know, never let a woman leave your presence without having been made to feel better about herself as a result of the interaction. And I know Mm -hmm. I sort of butchered that, but, you know, if they interacted with you, she should feel better about herself. You know, point of fact, no human should ever leave your presence without having been made to feel better about themselves in the interaction. And with that being the case, it, the humans are your waiters, your waitresses, your Lyft drivers, your Starbucks coffee baristas, the person behind the counter at the airline. And then, and then that becomes part of your MO and, and your world becomes a different place. It just becomes a more pleasant place to be in. Yeah, I would say the same is true in customer service. Nobody's gonna bring a problem and leave their life behind they're bringing their problem and frustration my my i need my oil changed somebody just hit me i need gas my kids got f f grades 
they come in, they're coming to the situation. How do you provide that, that same experience where they left that situation better than they arrived? And I, I love that, how you brought that to, to the relationship with, with, on the dating side. But, you know, when it comes to the contact center, like I said, at the very beginning, most people don't call into the contact center happy. I always joke that they listen to the Rocky music, the, the soundtrack, they either they're 10, 15 pushups and they're getting ready to uh, fire it up, right? And they're, so what tactics do you recommend using when customers are, are ready outside of, and maybe there's a blend of all of these, but is it, is it just listening? Is it tactical empathy? Is it mirroring? Is it labeling or is it something else? All right. If, if, if I'm, if I'm working on the, <clears throat> the receiving side of those calls, mm-hmm. I'm going to start out by labeling the emotion that I hear and, and being willing to make it sound like I'm partially culpable because they think you are. So I would probably start with it. It sounds like what we did has really upset you. Now that's not saying that you actually, it sounds like what we did has upset you. That's empathy. Mm -hmm. Now there's, there's something that I hear constantly that I understand why it's being used. And I, I utterly despise it. And I know the customer service reps are trained to say, I'm sorry that happened to you. <laughs> or some I, sort of an apology. I knew that was coming. Everybody does it. Now, and, and first of all, you say it because you're trained. And one in three people hearing the words, I'm sorry, is almost life changing for them. And those stick out in your brain. The fact that the other person detests it two out of three times is lost on you because they probably don't immediately scream at you for it. I can tell you that I feel like screaming at the person. I don't because what I feel like when somebody says that to me is I'm talking to an idiot and screaming at an idiot never helped me. So I know you're trained to do that. And I know in one in three times, it's a life-changing moment for the other person. And you remember that and you value that because if you're working customer service, you probably actually care about the people that are calling in. You know, not everybody in customer service does, but you probably actually care. And to have that kind of a positive effect on someone is genuinely meaningful for you. And you don't realize the degree that the other two out of three detest it because they don't give you that strong of a reaction. But, you know, I got, I got really solid reasons. The Black Swan group, we have tested literally in excess of 20,000 people for their conflict type. Thomas Kilman conflict mode instrument is a testing tool that we used to use. We've now adapted it for our own purposes. We believe the world splits evenly into three types, fight, flight, make friends. Uh, and we got no shortage of data that makes us very confident in that assessment. And it doesn't matter if you're Chinese or uh, Latino or African or Western European or vegan, it doesn't make any difference. The world splits very evenly into thirds we've polled globally everybody people in every country we get solid data fight flight make friends one evenly into thirds the make friends person lives for the apology and apologies are transformative for them and cannot be transformed until they've heard it the other two out of the three all say the same thing. That's a cheap currency. You didn't change my problem by apologizing. I still got the same problem. It was there before you apologized and it's thereafter. 
but the customer service people that train to apologize and they have some very solid feedback that encourages it. Yeah. I mean, even on the opposite side as a consumer, if somebody says, I'm sorry, I should just label or mirror it, say, I'm sorry. And hear back what they, what they're, what they're going to say. I always try to think of it from the consumer side too. So Chris, I wrap up every podcast with two questions. Super easy. What book or person has influenced you the most in the past year? So parameters. And then if you could leave a note to all customer service professionals, it's going to hit everybody's desk Monday at 8 a.m. So they can acknowledge and understand and do something about it. Past 11, they're toast. What would it say? All right. And then well, I want to tell people how to follow up with my company. So when yes, you sir. where you are. Yep. All right. The book in the last year, probably taken for a ride by Bob. Oh, no, no, no. The Ride of a Lifetime by Bob Iger, former CEO of Disney. Relentless in his understanding and application of empathy throughout his career. Um, got written off time after time. Was in company after company that was bought by other companies. What normally happens when the company you're in is purchased? Shortly thereafter, you're shown the door or you get out. He rose to the top every time, every time. Ended up in charge of Disney. Not only ended up in charge of Disney, but was told explicitly when he was the number two in Disney and he was up for the number one job, the board was against him hmm. because they saw him as another version of the former CEO who'd been booted and forced out. But his application, not only did he get the job, but he stayed in the job for like 15 years. So The Ride of a Lifetime, Bob, Bob Iger, great book, interesting dude, well-written. Um, a lot of times books that are they're, they're about great stories and not that well-written. I found this one to be very well-written. All right, yeah. second question, the note I put on people's desk. Take the time to actually hear people out. You're going to get basically a seven to one rate of return on your time because people are going to continue to come back to you until they feel heard out and if you hear them out in the first meeting it doesn't take that long very short period of time you know show them demonstrate your understanding get a that's right out of them you got to do it once they're going to keep coming back to you on bad implementation, misunderstanding of ideas, out and out resistance to what you wanted, time after time after time, until they feel heard out, or until you fire them, or they quit, or everybody moved on, or the project got implemented horribly. The rate of return on hearing people out is easily seven to one. Every 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 ten minutes spent hearing somebody out is going to save you 70 minutes of trying to fix things that have been going bad. So hear people out, demonstrate your understanding. You're going to add time back into your life. You're not going to know where it came from. I love that. And, and then, so how, 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 how can the black swan group meet you where you are? My, my listeners are all ears. First of all, subscribe to the newsletter. Send, send, you want to learn the black swan method. You want to be a black swan. The text message you send is black swan method, three words, spaces in between, not cap sensitive. Text to the number 33777. Again, black swan method to 33777. You get a response back to sign you up for the newsletter, which is actionable. I mean, it's free, but that's not what makes it valuable. It's concise and it's actionable. It's the gateway to our website, blackswanltd.com. On that website, we have training for you wherever you are. We've got a real basic training, the N9, to give you some skills to get you started. It's, I think it's a 90-minute session. Relatively speaking, it's low-priced. We got some high dollar training that is going to do you no good if that's not where you are in your journey. 
we got, we got, it doesn't make any difference whether you're a man or a woman. It doesn't make any difference if your coach is a man or a woman. We got some female coaches. You know, we, we, we will meet you where you are. Come to the Black Swan Group. We'll help you move into a more enjoyable life. I would highly recommend it. I am on your guys's email list and it's a ton of valuable information. It's not just, it's not just about the tactical empathy. It's not just about learning about the FBI tactics that you've been going through, but it's everyday life. Like there's a ton of things that you could just go through and listen in on and, and use and try to practice in. Like you said, start with the barista, start with what you say in the book about buying your, your, your Ford pickup or your, uh, your uh, Toyota pickup truck. Right, right. And just sitting there and waiting and, and having the sales guy scramble. Yeah. And and go through that process. So highly recommend checking it out. Buy the book, never split the difference. Negotiation if your life depends on it. And uh sign up for everything they have to offer, but start with where you're at today. Chris, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. It's been a blast. I really, really, really enjoyed it, got a lot of value it, and I'm I'm sure my listeners did as well. Thanks, Nick. Pleasure being on.